Winds of change are blowing through Raider Nation. And Silver and Black Today keeps you up to date with the latest news and views about your Las Vegas Raiders. Touchdown, Las Vegas! With insight, opinions, and interviews. We're on the cutting edge of what's happening now. Now, now. with the latest on your Raiders and the NFL. Your host, Scott Goldbranson and Mo Moten. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports Original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Do us a favor if you don't already subscribe to the show. Wherever you get your audio, check it out. Put on that auto download for us. We appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, hello again. Thanks for hitting the subscription button and the notifications bell. Also, give us a thumbs up there, too. And always good times in the chat, as we learned last week doing a live show. We're here on Tuesday. NFL owners meetings are underway. Some tidbits to talk about. Antonio Pierce was with the media yesterday. Tom Telesco has been doing some interviews. So we're going to get into that. My name is Scott Branson. I'm your host. I am an editor writer over at sportsnot.com. Also joining us, my co-host, my partner in all of this. That is Mr. Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. Also Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show. S N B today. All right, Mo uh, owners meetings. So that just means everybody kind of crawls out of their hole for a little bit and you can talk to them post post combine. Uh, and of course, head coaches meet together. Or they do their team picture, which is always funny to me. Uh, their, their, their class picture, if you will, of all the coaches, they do the same thing with the GMs and all of that, but some interesting tidbits coming up. A lot of folks talking still about what the Raiders are going to do in the draft, talking about the quarterback position, especially since that's obviously a huge area of need for this team. But as we stand today, Raiders, uh, no significant free agent signings of, of, of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks or needs they still have. Cornerback, we talked a lot about last week, for example. Haven't gone out and cut those deals yet, um, but uh, I, people are itching, right? People want to get to the draft. They want to know where this team is going. But I think this is the no normal progression of things that people start going through withdrawal but we will get some new rules, I think, coming out of this owner's meeting. We'll also hear a little bit. Uh, we did hear a little bit from Tom Telesco. Any surprises for you so far, what you've heard coming out of the Raider organization this offseason? Absolutely not. The only the only thing that, and I guess we'll talk about some of Tom Telesco's comments, the one revealing thing that I, I wouldn't say I didn't see happening, but that was revealing to me was, the Raiders may play Thea Mumford. At, they may kick him in the guard. That's something yeah. that um, that's a new development that hasn't been talked about. Thea Mumford has experience all over the offensive line going back to semi Ohio State. So it makes sense, but it's something that hasn't been talked about at length, at least from, from my perspective, from my timeline, from the shows that I listened to until Tom Tusco brought that up with JT DeBrick over on the, the Motherland Station. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think... You, you never know, right? We we all make assumptions in the media, fans. We all think about what makes sense. But uh, obviously, inside, they have a plan. And we'll talk a little bit now about uh, the, the interviews uh, Tom Telesco has been doing and around uh, as far as what's going on. The Raiders, looking at um, what, what they need to do to build this team, they're obviously in a win-now mode, Mo. We've talked about this numerous times. This team is not saying, hey, we're going to slow build this, get our quarterback and young quarterback and kind of build around him like some of the other teams are doing out there. No, they they went out, they signed Gardner Minshew, some people criticizing them for giving him the money. I think that's ridiculous. You posted up on X.com, I think it was over the weekend, saying, look, if you look at his, his dollar figure as a spot starter versus as a really second tier backup or starter, he's he's not overpaid. It's It's kind of what the market bears. Uh, but what did you see out of you talked about the Mumford stuff? But what did you hear from Tom Telesco that gave you any insight to maybe what are the Raiders thinking heading into the draft? Well, he called two positions a work in progress, the cornerback position and the offensive line group. So that tells me that they're definitely going to make some notable additions to those two areas. I expect them to make notable additions to those two areas before the draft. I had a Bleach Report live last Thursday, and I said if the season started today, DJ Fluker would be the Raiders' starting right guard. And DJ Fluker hasn't played a regular season game since 2020. <laughs> That's three years of inaction. Uh -oh. so there's, there's no way. I understand Tom Tesco drafted DJ Fluker, you know, early, 
years and like you know, over a decade ago. <laughs> but uh, it's been three years since he took a regular season snap, and there's no way I would be shocked and, and astounded if he's the starting right guard come week one of the 2024 season. So I expect not only the Raiders to sign a, a veteran guard, but also to, to draft a guard pretty early. At cornerback, we already know what the deal is there. Amig Robertson is no longer there. Brandon Faison would be the starting cornerback at the season start today. Uh, again, he played for the Chargers, so Tom Tusco is familiar with him, but I don't expect him to be the starter week one opposite Jack Jones. I expect it to be a veteran, and there are a lot of quality veteran cornerbacks still left on the market or a rookie. Yes, well said. And I think the one thing that I took away from, from hearing from Tom Telesco too was I felt, and again, we talk about lying season. We talk about how how uh, uh, coaches, GMs, they, they're going to tell you a narrative that they want to tell you. I get that. But the, what I like about the Raiders' narrative right now, Mo, is the aggressiveness, right? Tom Telesco is talking aggressively, even talking about free agency. He said they weren't done. He said they're not done. Uh, and that they, when they went out and they wanted to make a big splash, of course, Christian Wilkins was that big splash before Minshew. And he said, look, we need a player. I don't want one-year contracts. You know, I want I want to build, especially up on that defense, he wanted to get somebody in there who he could invest in that he believed would make this team far better overall. He did that with Christian Wilkins. And I still think he'll do that at, at cornerback. And I think there's guys out there who you can sign. We talked about several of them last week. But I think that's the thing. You have to do it. I also believe that aggressiveness – will carry over to the draft. I know most fans, and including you and I at doing this show, we've said it's going to be really hard for the Raiders to trade up. There's been talk about Washington. Washington's not going to trade out. I'm telling you right now. I'll bet anybody a pair of shoes. I don't care what you want. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to. In this quarterback class, they're not going to. But anyway, the Raiders, there's still a chance so they can get higher than they are now and maybe try to snag that quarterback or stay at 13, uh, trade back into the – back into the first round and get a quarterback like Michael Penix Jr. Whether you like these quarterbacks I'm mentioning or not is not what I'm concerned with. I don't care if you like them or not. My point to you, Mo, is I find that Tom Telesco, knowing what this Raider team needs to do, knowing they're on that that cusp of being a playoff team, they got to be aggressive in all aspects of player acquisition. They have to be aggressive within reason. Uh, cool. I, I feel like it seems like J.J. McCarthy is going to go possibly no no lower than six because right. there's so much smoke around him and the giants if jj mccarthy goes six and the top three quarterbacks off the board and caleb williams Jaden daniels and drake may then it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't pay for the raiders to be aggressive to move up for a quarterback at that point because what are you moving up into the top 10 for mm -hmm. bo nix or michael Penix? there are people that believe those two guys will be available in the second round i'm not saying they will be but I'm not moving up into the top 10 for either of those quarterbacks. And I like Michael Penix, but I'm not moving up to seven, eight, nine, ten for Michael Penix. He's <laughs> going to be there. He's probably he's probably going to be there available for you at 13. Now, if the Raiders were to draft Michael Penix at 13, some fans don't like that idea because they say it's overdrafting as reaching. I wouldn't mind it because if if you feel like Michael Penix could be a franchise guy, then go for it. Right. Uh, but at, just understand that if you don't take Michael Penix at 13 and you really want him, there's a possibility he's going to be off the board. A lot of people talk about Seattle and the Seahawks. I think they're drafting 18 or 19 because Michael Penix's offense, former offensive coordinator is there and Ryan Grubb from Washington. But they traded for Sam Howell. So I don't think the Seattle Seahawks are going to draft Michael Penix at, you know, in the teens. I think the Raiders, if they really want him and they want to secure him, they're going to either have to trade back into the first round mm -hmm. or trade up in the second round, kind of like the Tennessee Titans did last year for Will Levis. Right. And what we don't know, and but when, when you talk about, hey, look, Michael Penix, and I think I, there's lots of folks that I read in our industry who I really trust, who have great inside sources, who say the exact same thing. Hey, Penix, Knicks, they're going to be top of second round guys, maybe, maybe bottom first. Um, but crazy stuff happens on draft day, right? And you don't know if you're sitting there at 13 and it could be false. It could be true, whatever. And you start to hear a team's, oh man, somebody's going to grab Penix in the twenties. If we don't get them now, then you, it forces your hand. Now I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it, I've seen it happen in the past. You've seen that go where a team says, man, we were going to draft that kid. We, we had him projected early second round and somebody there's a run and people get nervous. And so they grab that quarterback. And so, um, 
it'll be interesting to see how that falls out. Now, like you said, there's some people who don't like the the the, the specific quarterbacks you mentioned, uh, and everybody's got their own opinion on going back and forth in the first round, drafting up, go moving, trying to move up, trying to move down, addressing the offensive tackle position, addressing the cornerback position, all that kind of stuff. All of it's good. So either way, the Raiders are going to get a good player at 13. That's the way I look at it. And uh, whether it's a quarterback, cornerback, or defensive uh, tackle, or I'm um, excuse me, offensive tackle. Sorry, wrong side of the ball. Then, then it works out good for them. So, I, I this overdrafting, underdrafting thing, it's it's hard to tell, but I do think I like at least what I'm hearing. I think it, there's definitely a sense of the urgency there. I didn't even feel that last year with the former regime, even though there was a sense of urgency for them. I feel it just feels different this time. Does that you feel the same way I do? I feel different simply because Tom Telesco actually has a, a track record. We didn't right. we didn't know the track record of much of Dave Ziegler as a you know as a primary GM. He was quote unquote the de facto GM with the Patriots, but we all know Bill Belichick was running the show over there. Mm -hmm. Right. So with Tom Telesco, we actually can look back at what he did with the Chargers in his years for what a, a decade or you know, decade plus and kind of see what, what type of trends stick out, what type of things can we expect. And I and I'll say the one thing that I looked at and I saw this early and I mentioned this early on the X is don't be surprised if Tom Telesco drafts a linebacker in the middle rounds. He he's done it he's done it multiple times while he's with the Chargers, while the Raiders have their their two starting linebackers in Divine Diablo and Robert Spillane. Both those guys have only one year left on their contracts, and Tom Telesco doesn't have any allegiance to them because he didn't bring them to Las Vegas. Right. That was the previous regime. Even though Antonio Pierce and that defensive staff is mostly still there, understand that the GM may have a different long term view for the team. So I I actually it's not an impressive linebacker class. So right. if the Raiders are going to take a linebacker, I would advise them to do it within the first uh, maybe three, four rounds if they're going to take one. Because see, I only like maybe three or four linebackers, and one of them has an injury history in Peyton Wilson out of NC State. So I, I would say look out for a linebacker. Um, but to answer your question, there are some things that stick out. There are, other, there are some other trends that stick out about Tom Telesco. I'm sure we'll get to in the next few weeks too yeah absolutely and we'll start going through also more in-depth draft uh scouting information if you will before we get to uh april and of course we we told you uh brian baldinger will be on here in a couple weeks to give us his take on the raiders and the draft and how things are going to go down i'm interested though too i i look at at you, where you started with the offensive line and 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 the fact that they're they're think they're thinking about or will maybe move mumford to guard um, when you start to look at the the free agent market, not so much. Uh, definitely, there's some good depth at guard. But when you look at the draft and offensive tackle, I see Tom Telesco talking a lot about it. I think that's that's good. That's recognition of the fact that uh, the the offensive line needs that work. It needs that depth. To me, that is important because a lot of folks, you know, oh, we need to draft an offensive line. We need to go get offensive line before we even worry about the quarterback. And the reality is, Mo, it's not one or the other. It has to be both at the same time. And we'll get into the quarterback thing here after the break. But um, that is important. And I think that when you look at offensive line, it's hard for people. They know they need it. Like I'm talking about the fans and the folks that listen to our show. They know they need it. They're just not sure exactly how to build it. And I think that when you look at – Yes, you can take an offensive tackle in the first round, but you can also get really good ones in the second and third and sometimes fourth round. And I know there's examples past that too, but there's a lot of depth there coming up here in this draft. Yeah, I was playing general manager Mo with, over the weekend, and <laughs> I will say that there are three positions where you can get good players into the fifth round. I think cornerback is one guard and offensive tackle mm. those three positions and in, in particular i didn't look too much into the interior defensive uh lineman position because i think the raiders are set there uh, but of the, among the positions of need for the raiders this is a good year to need offensive linemen and this is also a good year to need cornerbacks and that happens to be two of the raiders primary needs so just because they don't draft the cornerback for in the first round and it's not terry on arnold or quinion mitchell doesn't mean that the Raiders can't get a starter on day two because they definitely can with this with this group. I expect the Raiders to 
uh, draft multiple offensive linemen. Yes. So I think they get a starter early in round one. I'll stick to that position. I know some people like you think they go cornerback in, in round one. I still think they go offensive line because on the right side of the Raiders line, they have Mumford and DJ Fluger. I don't yeah. think either of those guys are, are going to be week one starters. I know a lot of fans think uh, they have Mumford has what it takes to be a starter. Maybe he does. Uh, he, he was pretty good in spot starts this past season. I believe he had 10 starts on both sides of the line. I'm not dismissing Thea Mumford at all, but I'm saying that I think the Raiders go early at tackle mm -hmm. and they get a right tackle. And that guy, whoever it is, is going to start. Yeah, it'll be interesting because I think a lot of there's a lot of, uh, you know, you start to see all these mock drafts come out. A lot of people now have Quinion Mitchell going to the Raiders. I think he might be gone. Or to your point, they might go offensive tackle. But then even into the second round, they get to that 44th pick. You know, you think about a guy like Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. There's probably four or five guys. I'm not kidding you, Mo. In that fourth, in that second to third round, who who literally just would start day one in the NFL. I mean, that's how good of a class I think it is. Uh, I'm not trying to just overplay it. So to your point, you can get lower. There, and, and you're right. They'll take more than one. Uh, but they can get a starter, I believe, on that right side in that first or second round uh, and then you're free to do whatever you need to do. Right. And, and it depends what they do. If they can, if they can get another pick in that second round or first round uh, then, then suddenly they can address the quarterback position. Also, you talk about that right side. Now I'm not saying it's going to happen. And I know some of you will hate to hear this, but if they were to take Michael Penix jr, he's a lefty, right? So his backside is what side Mo? The right side. Exactly. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that that's playing. You got to have a good, you got to have a good offensive line, no matter who your quarterback is. Right. But I'm, if, if they go with a lefty and he doesn't necessarily mean that they'll, that he'll start if he gets drafted by the Raiders, clearly with Minshew and O'Connell there, but there's definitely that. And I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's going to be one of those situations where a lot of people will be disappointed that the Raiders don't take a quarterback in the first round or able to move up. And a lot of people will be disappointed with the quarterback they do take whenever they take them. I think that's pretty much going to be a guarantee uh, based on that, unless you're in the top three, which it's not going to be possible, I don't think, to get into. So it'll be interesting. Uh, but we'll be here for all of it. All right, we're going to take our first break here on the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black today in this offseason, the week of the NFL owners meetings. Coaches, GMs are all there too. Media gaggles at the table, breakfast and all that kind of stuff. Yuck and yuck. Uh, we'll get there and we'll talk a little bit about what Antonio Pierce had to say about Aiden O'Connell. Can Aiden O'Connell learn to run better? He answered that. We'll talk about that when we come back. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Raiders. You're with Mo and Scott. We're coming back right after this. Welcome back. Home stretch here on Silver and Black Today on off-season edition. Hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Not a ton of news going on, but hey, the NFL owners meetings, I'm sure there'll be some rules. The hip drop tackle. By the way, you're with Scott. You're with Mo. Follow Mo on x.com. At Momoton, M O E M O T O N, at L V Gully. And Mo, today is Tuesday. Uh, are you doing Bleacher Report live this week? Tell everybody what you got going. No more Bleacher Report lives. I did one on Monday. Uh, shout out to everyone who showed up and watched a mock draft that I put together, whether you hated it or <laughs> loved it. But I will go back into my writing cave over the next two weeks. You won't see me on a Bleacher Report live until April 8th, where I'll talk about some draft sleepers. But in the meantime, I will. I will be here, obviously, with you, Scott. And I also have some pieces over at sportsnot.com just leading up to the draft because now we're we're within a month of the draft. So now month. Create the first waves of rage are now over. Teams yes. are still making small signings here and there. I expect Again, I expect the Raiders to make a couple. But uh, it's all about the draft from here on out. That's right. And next week, especially, look for us. We're going to start going through the positions. We'll start with the biggest positions of need for the Raiders. So, of course, offensive line, offensive tackle, particularly – cornerback quarterback and then we'll get to linebacker and some other skill positions and, and whatnot so we got a lot of time to do that but that's what we're going to fill the show with because we've gotten a lot of feedback from folks who say hey when are you guys going to start going into that and, and we're gonna or trust me i know mo you're going to be writing about it constantly between now and then as will i and we'll get you guys up to speed on that interesting though too i got some feedback <laughs> so many people love the live shows and then i heard from people who don't like the live shows and it was like, it was interesting because, you know, I, I hear from people and you, you kind of listen to, you want to listen to your listeners and do what they like. And I had a couple of our longtime listeners, I'll hold, I'll withhold their names because I didn't ask them to talk about it on the air, but 
who were like, yeah, you know, I love the show. I never miss a show, but this live thing where you're talking to people in the chat, I, 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 I just had to turn it off. I was like, okay, cool. You know, it's all good. Um, but we, we try to do that a little bit, the live stuff, because I think it's, it's fun. And we had a great time doing that. So for those of you who like it, thank you. For those of you who don't, we understand and it's totally cool, but we're, our formatting goes back and forth. And so we try to make sure every, we try to make sure everybody's happy, Mo. Sometimes, you know the old saying, you know the old saying says, Scott, if you try to make everyone happy, you're not going to make anyone. anybody happy. That's right. So that's why we'll do it when we do it. We don't, we don't. That's the way it goes. So fun times. Uh, listen, so at, at the NFL owners meeting, media got to have breakfast with, uh, with Antonio Pierce and talk about a range of subjects. And we'll, we'll address some of those on Thursday too, during the Raider Nation mailbag. By the way, and I'll, I'll throw the number up for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, but, but if you want to call in and leave your voicemail for Thursday's show, it's area code 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869, the Raider Nation mailbag. Call in, leave your name, where you're calling from, and your message. Try to make it, you know, less than two minutes or so. A minute and a half is perfect, actually. But yeah, so we'll do that. We'll answer some more of those questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot on that. But Antonio Pierce... Mo was asked about Aiden O'Connell. Of course, there's a lot of people. It's interesting. I don't understand people who are shocked by, by, by Antonio Pierce saying that it's Aiden O'Connell's job going in. He was the starting quarterback at the end of last year. The quarterback room was emptied. Yes, they signed Gardner Minshew. What, what did people expect? Like, uh, he's the starting quarterback until he's not. So you go into camp with your starter from last year. He has to earn it. He's not – Antonio Pierce isn't saying Aiden O'Connell is the starting quarterback the first game of the year without a doubt bank it right now. He's not saying that. He's saying going into camp, he's the guy. He earned it. He deserves it. And so that's where you stand. Now, Gardner Minshew could beat him out. Who knows? I'm not saying he will. Or a rookie quarterback or another free agent if they don't draft a quarterback comes in. So I'm I'm interested why people are shocked by that. What Antonio Pierce said, we'll get into the comments, but yeah. what it says to me is that the Raiders have an open quarterback competition going to the camp. Aiden O'Connell was exactly. there already. He's the incumbent. We understand that. He played well toward the end of the season. A lot mm -hmm. of people quote the stats. Eight touchdown passes, zero interceptions in his last four games, the last four starts. I get that, and that's why he's earned – Mm -hmm. for Antonio Pierce to say, well, he's the guy until someone beats him out, right? Right. But the Raiders did sign Gardner Minshew to a two-year, $25 million deal with $15 million in guarantees. And that $15 million in guarantees is not small chump change. Not to <laughs> us regular people <laughs> and not relative to the quarterback market. That's above, to me, that's above what a, what a definitive number two quarterback would make. Correct. I put up the numbers on Sunday night, and I understand Gardner Minshew is on a two-year deal, so his guarantees are a little higher, but his guarantees are spread out over almost evenly over two years. So there's a good chance that he's going to be around for both of those years of his contract. But the, to me, the guaranteed money tells me that there's a possibility that Gardner Minshew will start and the Raiders understand that because they don't know how the draft is going to pan out. Mm -hmm. It seems like they want to draft a quarterback, but it may turn out that they don't draft one. And then you then you have Gardner Minshew and, and Aiden O'Connell in, a, in a, basically a one-on-one -on -one battle. Maybe you add another late-round quarterback who's not going to be ready to play right away. But to me, the, with the contract that they gave Gardner Minshew, it tells me that it's an open competition. There's a possibility that Gardner Minshew could start over Aiden O'Connell. Yeah, and 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 we said this going back to before – I mean, right when the season ended and we started talking about looking forward, Mo – which was the idea that the Raiders had to address the quarterback position. Absolutely. And they had to do it in phases and they had to do it with backup plans. They had to, okay, Aiden O'Connell. Great. You got him. He's already there. Then you had to go get a veteran guy who could start if you needed him to Gardner Minshew. And then you had to draft a guy. So, so they've done two of the three things I believe they had to do going in. And, and if you're, if you're not liking Gardner Minshew, to me, he was the third best quarterback available in free agency and you got him. Right? I'm not saying that he's the guy who's going to take you to the promised land. I'm just saying he was the third best option in the market with Kirk Cousins being first, which no, the Raiders weren't going to spend that kind of money anyway. So that that works out well for them. And it'll be interesting, though, with this and Aiden O'Connell coming in. And I understand a lot of folks out there think Aiden O'Connell can be a – and I'm talking about listeners I hear from – think that he can be a franchise quarterback or that we just don't know if he can be. 
I I'm pessimistic that he could be. I think he's going to be a good quarterback in the NFL. I think he can win games for you. I think he's a good backup. Now that doesn't mean he won't win the winning starting, excuse me, the starting job this year, depending on what happens in that situation. But at the owners meeting, Vic Tafer, I took the audio from his tweet. So full credit to him, uh, asked Antonio Pierce about Aiden O'Connell. And so I just want to share this comment with everybody. And so here's, um, Pierce on O'Connell and sort of his style of play. I would love to see him become more vocal, right? Is he ever going to become a runner? No, not going to happen. That's okay. But there's other ways that you can do that and move around in the pocket. I think he's done a great job this all season, being the building, staying in the Las Vegas area and really working on it. So one thing I love to see him do is be more vocal. You know, you don't so there you go. I know it was kind of loud because it was on Vic's phone and obviously it's, I took that off a tweet. But yes, and there's there's Antonio Pierce Mo saying, yeah, he's not going to be a runner. <laughs> We know that, he, but there are things, and we talked about this a couple shows ago, there are things he can do to become better in the pocket. He was a rookie last year, of course. And then hearing that he's been staying in Las Vegas, he's been working out there, uh, and then at the end there, which is really key, because even though the teammates talk very highly of him, he's a very mature guy, all that stuff, Pierce wants him to be a vocal leader. Number one, that's because I think as a quarterback, you need to be. Number two, Pierce talks about the culture he's building. It's it's a it's a loud and aggressive culture, which is great. That's why fans love it. So him saying at the end there that he needs to be more vocal was an interesting piece too, I thought, in a very small comment. Yeah, it's a it's a leadership position. Right. Uh, so you don't you don't want your quarterback to to be timid or comatose in the huddle, especially in big moments. Because players, even though these players all get paid millions, players need to look toward a leader when, you know, it's a two minute drive and you need a you need a scoring uh drive to win the game or tie the game, whatever. You need that vocal leader in there. Not you not necessarily have to be Rich Gannon, but you have to be able to uh instill confidence in your teammates as the leader of that of that huddle on the on the offensive side of the ball. So uh, I think, you know, that comes with experience. He was a rookie last year. Remember, he didn't start the full season, took over after Josh McDaniels was fired. So as he gets more comfortable with his teammates and being a starter, I think that could come. Because let, let's understand, while at Purdue, I would say that we had, and we had a someone who covered Ado kind of closely. I think he has the leadership qualities. Yeah. And Dave Ziegler talked about it. He has the neck up qualities. I think part of that is, is the leadership along with the toughness, the mental toughness, what he went through at Purdue. So uh, I think that will come with time. As far as the mobility part of this, and we talked about this on a previous show, he can he can improve his pocket awareness, which will allow him to evade pressure and elude pressure, elude uh, defenders coming at him. But as Pierce said, he's never going to be a runner. He's not going to improve <laughs> his athleticism that no. much, if at, if at all. But what he can do is be able to identify defenders coming at him, blitzes, uh, and, and be able to just kind of sidestep. We talked about That's Brady exactly. and Manning. Those are extreme examples or the yeah. top examples of immobile quarterbacks who had some elusiveness in the pocket. Watch more of Brady. He can watch more of Brady and, and Peyton Manning and see how those guys moved around without being, you know, super athletic guys who, you know, run for a bunch of yards and pick up first downs frequently with their legs. I think those will be uh, primary examples for Aiden O'Connell going forward. Yeah. And listen, I, I, we talked about it last year during preseason. When we were, when we were, we were saying that, you know, if Jimmy G wasn't going to be healthy, that you give him as much time as possible. The kids got talent. I think it's interesting too, about the vocal leaders comment to your point about leading is that I think People can lead quietly, but there's always a time when you need to lead and be out more front and be more animated. And I think that there's plenty of examples in the NFL of quarterbacks who were quiet leaders, not boastful guys or anything like that. But man, on the field, I mean, they would you know, even Joe Montana, who's as stoic as you can find when he got fired up and when he was in a huddle, you could see the animated nature there. And I think that's too. I think Aiden O'Connell is so mature sometimes. And I think that's where the vocalness comes in as well as the idea that you got to take control of things. Like you got to step up and say, okay, it's me now. Look at me. We're going, we're doing this. And, and, and you're right. That's experience. And it just, especially in the NFL surrounded by all that talent, it's a whole different game. I'm sure Aiden O'Connell learns so much. So I'm excited to see him going to camp and, and with the open competition, by the way, Tom Telesco said that about every position on the team. He said, we want open competition. We want more competition because that's how you get better. Now, 
the key there, Mo, is to have good competition, even in camp, you got to have depth. And so that's where the draft, that's where the rest of free agency comes in. And, and we'll see what, what goes on there. But I, I just thought that, that those comments were interesting as loud as they were in the background. Uh, and, and it's going to be fascinating to watch. I love how often these days do you go into an NFL camp where you have a quarterback competition like that? It's, it's happening less and less unless your team's in trouble rebuilding or something like that. Uh, but a team like the Raiders on the cusp of the playoffs, perhaps, uh, to have that's going to be fun. I think for fans it'll be fun because you're going to get the best guy coming out of that is going to be the hottest hand. Right, and I think the Reds are going to have a true quarterback competition. Now, and, unless they somehow get one of the top three prospects in the draft, I think it'll be a real quarterback competition, and not one of those competitions where a team drafts a quarterback early and you know eventually he's going to be the starter, right? Yes. I think it's going to be – we we I, we – really won't know who's going to come out on top. Will it Will it be Gardner Minshew, Aiden O'Connell, or a rookie? And I don't have a problem with that. And I think too many people get caught up in, in rooting for a specific quarterback to win the competition. Mm. Me, I'm just looking for the best quarterback to win the job. Yes. May the best quarterback win the job, whoever that is. If it's Aiden O'Connell, fine. If it's Gardner Minshew, fine. If it's, a, if it's a rookie they drafted in the second, third round, fine as long as he was the best quarterback at camp through the summer through the preseason fine with it and i think that's that's the best way to go about it if you're the raiders because you you don't right as of right now you don't have a surefire starter you can't say this guy's definitely going to start if the season starts today the raiders don't have that right now right they have some possibilities i think antonio pierce said when you have two the old saying is when you have two quarterbacks on the roster you have none <laughs> right as a starter yeah. because they don't know who's going to start yet and I think competition at camp will decide that, which is which is a good thing. Right. And you're not gonna you might you'll see one or two of those guys play in preseason, but not the other, you know, depending or you might see all three. I don't know. We'll see. That could that could happen as well because they're in the competition and you want to see live game action. But some interesting other tidbits from that interview that that um that Antonio Pierce did uh is is again, we're seeing the tone and, and I like this actually. Uh, I like that he's being very consistent with his language and the narrative about the team he is building. He says uh, this morning, or excuse me, on, on Monday morning, uh, quote, uh, I, when it comes to assigning kids, and I would assume this carries over to the draft too, when it comes to signing free agents, quote, I'm the guardian at the gate. I'm not letting any evil into that building. Really interesting there, right? And obviously, I think that addresses what happened with Josh McDaniels and all that jazz and some of those people that they had there. And the other one was on uh, talking about Jack Jones and Nate Hobbs. They brought a swagger. Uh, we're not getting that little sucker in the way. I mean, just this little thing. The other thing is, and, and I know some Raider fans out there, especially the ones I hear about, Mo, for, about the quarterback situation. Here's what, here's what uh, Antonio Pierce said about J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy is a national champion. How is he not in the top three quarterbacks? That's what Antonio Pierce said. Now, I know, lying season, misdirection, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, of course, we heard his old coach, now the Chargers coach, Jim Harbaugh, say the exact same thing at the same meeting. So uh, it, it'll be it'll be interesting with that quarterback. Man, that, the draft is going to be nuts. That first, The first five picks of the draft are going to be a hell of a ride. Right. It, I Though I still think quarterbacks go one, two, three, mm -hmm. I think it starts to get interesting when the Giants pick at six i think that's where it gets real interesting because i i strongly believe the cardinals if they don't move back they're going to take marvin harrison jr right the chargers who knows what they're going to do it's a new regime that'll be also an interesting pick but the giants if they take jj mccarthy at six then what happens with the vikings in their first their two first rounders do they move up they, they try to jump over the giants and trade with the cardinals or do they just let it flow and, and and just stick with their two first round picks and just get two potential starters? If the Giants don't take J.J. McCarthy, then I think there are going to be multiple teams, maybe including the Raiders, who, who then try to move up to number seven with the Tennessee yeah. Titans, who seem to be going all in on Will Levis yeah. for that seven spot to try to get J.J. McCarthy. So then that could cause a rush of trade offers and trade calls and, and some frenzy in the top 10 picks that we, we weren't anticipating. That Giants, the Giants and the Vikings, to me, their picks in that first round because the Vikings, depending what happened, I mean, crazy stuff happens sometimes. The Vikings could even move down more and get more draft capital. I mean, they, they have two first round draft picks, right? So they could even they could trade down from that first pick at eleven, right? They're eleven. 
trade down a couple spots, get another pick in the second. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, I would get greedy with picks if I was them because if you don't get the quarterback you want and there's somebody else you can get in in the in the 15 to 20 range, why wouldn't you move down and pick up some extra picks? I mean, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And, and the Raiders will be in the middle of it. We'll see how creative Tom Telesco has been. I've been reading a lot of draft guides, Mo, and one of the draft guides I was reading went through and was grading the last – the last five years of drafts by teams, you know, by each team. Now, a lot of those teams have had turnover in the front office, like the Raiders, like the Chargers. But I went back and read the Chargers one to see Tom Telesco, and they gave him a B plus over five years, which clearly, and I think the Raiders were a C something or other. And that was really because of the last two drafts, more than obviously the three that were terrible before that, <laughs> um, which I thought was a pretty high grade for the Raiders. Actually, I was expecting like a D um, and, or an F. So, so you look at what Tom Telesco has done in the draft. It hasn't always transpired well onto the field because the, the Chargers have been underperforming for many, many years, which is why so many of you were sort of befuddled when they hired Tom Telesco. But, Mo, you've pointed it out all along that he's had a great record of finding good talent and building. A, and the important thing here is building the roster. Not always, I'm not always talking about making some big move to go into the top three of the draft. I'm talking about building depth and finding talent at key positions in middle rounds. Right. I, I think if you look at Tom Tesco's track record, I don't have a, a big issue with his early round picks. Uh, this right. has been talked about before, that his early round picks have been pretty good outside of the guys who just can't stay healthy. But those guys have been impact players right away. And I think he talked about this with JT DeBrick. He said, when you're drafting in the first, second round, you're looking for guys who make an impact right away, right mm -hmm. out of the gate. You're hoping. And I, I think he, for the most part, he, he did that with the Chargers. His problem with the Chargers, again, was, as I said, guys, some, some of his top draft picks couldn't stay healthy. And two, he didn't resign some of the middle round guys because a lot of people say, well, he had troubles in the middle late rounds because those guys didn't get second contracts for whatever reason. And I think part of the reason is the Chargers did have turnover with their coaching staff. Big time. So they had Mike McCoy for a while while he was there. They had Anthony Lynn for a while. Brandon Brandon Staley was there. So there was there were times where the Chargers had a good middle round player, third or fifth round, but because of the coaching staff turnover, that new coaching staff wanted to bring in their guys. So they let go of someone who was maybe a fourth round pick, who was a decent player, but not necessarily a must keeper. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't I wouldn't come down too hard on saying, well, a lot of his guys. His middle round guys didn't get second round contract didn't get second contracts because you also have to weigh in what the coaches staff saw and what they wanted in some of these players so if the Raiders have some stability which they haven't had in recent years then i think uh, a lot more of his picks will pan out well and you also have to remember that there are when you draft especially in the middle rounds of course you'd love to hit a guy like max crosby right i mean you you draft in the fourth round and he's a he's an impact player a franchise type player but if you look at the history, and I did this too a couple of weeks ago, you look at the history of, of teams who draft and then players that they sign to their second contract, there is always a pretty big fall off because with the way the salary cap works and you see teams trade away or let players go off a second contract because at that point in time, they might have another need. So you have to let talent go. It doesn't mean that they weren't talented enough. And you've seen a lot of those players go on and play well with other teams and contribute. So that's something to watch too. When you look at those statistics, because uh, it's not always just because they weren't good. Now that happens too. a guy just doesn't play himself into a second contract goes on the free agent market at a very lower rate, but there are guys that you just, you, you let walk depending, or you, you move them before You've had a chance to sign them to their second contract because you have other needs and you have to go on uh, or you're paying your quarterback or whatever it is at that time. So something else to watch on that one. But it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch. I'm telling you the rest of the this way up until the draft, you're going to hear lots of rumors like you're hearing, like you said, a lot of J.J. McCarthy, the Giants piece of it. Um, and remember back we were we did a, a, a lot of a show several months ago where people were telling us we're crazy if we thought that either New York team would draft a quarterback. And here now we are talking about the Giants might sure might draft a quarterback. They might take McCarthy. Who knows if the Vikings that, can't jump ahead of them. Sorry, Scott, but that was like one of the biggest rumors coming out of uh, the combine. I think Rich yeah. Eisen went on the NFL network and he said, you know, he was hearing that the giants are absolutely done with Daniel Jones. Now there are conflicting reports out now that saying, you know, Daniel Jones is quarterback one, you know, Drew Locke is not going to be competing for the job is definitely Daniel Jones. But there's also a report out saying that Daniel Jones may not be ready. Mm -hmm. for training camp because of that i believe a knee injury he has so 
you have to factor that into it as well. Maybe the Giants are looking at a quarterback simply because maybe they're pessimistic about Daniel Jones's recovery rate and how he will perform once he's back on the field. So there are a lot of variables right there. And I think the Giants and the Chargers, as I said before, are that interesting 5-6 spot because those teams could, well, the Giants could trade, could draft the quarterback, the Chargers yeah. could trade back, the Chargers may want an impact player. Do they grow Brock Bowers tight end? Do they go offensive line? Do they go wide receiver because they let Mike Williams and Keenan Allen go? There's so many uh, pathways that the Chargers could take it. It makes the draft very interesting or very early. It will. And you're going to, for the next four weeks, you're going to hear rumor after rumor, move after move, because uh, there are a lot of things going on, but we don't necessarily have a ton of information on it. And teams are pretty tight lipped as they get their draft boards ready. So it'll be fun, but we'll be here to talk about it with you either way. It's going to be interesting. So Mo, what do you got going this week? I know you said you're, you're back into your writing cave um, and you'll have something up on sports, not on the Raiders this week, right? Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll look at positions as far as what the a player that the Raiders can draft in every round at a at a position of need. So let's take cornerback, for instance. I'll look at cornerbacks that they could draft in the first round, the second round, in the third round, the fourth round, the fifth round. Or I'll just do day one, day two, day three to make it a little more simplified. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a look at prospects that they could draft in each round, not just the first to first to third rounds, because I think – a lot of times when you listen to these draft experts and a lot of people, you only hear about the first or third round. What about mm -hmm. the fourth round? What about the fifth round? Remember Max Crosby, where he was drafted. Hunter mm -hmm. Renfro, though he's not the Raiders anymore, remember where he was drafted. So there are going to be some gems. I talked about it on the offensive line and the offensive line group and at cornerback. There are going to be some day two, early day three gems that the Raiders should pay attention to. No question. It's going to be fun, and we'll uh, we'll start gearing up for the draft next week here on the show. So read most piece up on Sports Not, but then we'll start getting some position breakdowns next week. So Mo and I will do some homework on those and uh, get to you with them. Also, do us a favor. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do so wherever you get your audio. We would appreciate that greatly. Also, if you're watching us, make sure you subscribe on the YouTube channel. Hit that notifications bell. Hit the thumbs up and appreciate all the chat as usual. Mo, my friend, I will see you on Thursday. We'll do the mailbag. Oh, don't forget. I got I to gotta put the number up there again. So for people watching, don't forget, Thursday is mailbag day. 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Leave your voicemail, name where you're calling from, and your message. And we'll get to it. We've had some great calls the past few weeks, man. I mean, the calls have been so great, Mo, that we're getting comments on YouTube about how good the calls are which is fantastic. It's a credit to our listeners. So wh which crowd are we pleasing on, on, on uh, the next show? Is it, is it the live crowd or is it the, is it the non pre-recorded? I, live I crowd? think they'll all appreciate it. I think, <laughs> I think they'll, they'll all appreciate it and um, we'll see where it all, all that's out, but it's fun. You know, <laughs> Hey, look, you don't have any games to either celebrate or complain about. And so, you know, we find what we need to do, but, we, we love all our folks, man. And even, even those of you, when we disagree, we have fun doing it. It's always respectful and we certainly appreciate it. So I can't wait till Thursday. It's always good times. So call in. I know we already got a bunch in, so we'll get to as many as we can. That's the other thing. If your call doesn't make it on one show, we we'll try to carry it over as long as it's still relevant. It's not talking about somebody who's gone or something like that. I'll try to get it over to the other side. You can also email us. I know some of you don't like to, to leave your voice or whatever. That's cool. It's, it's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. We'll also start getting some other folks, some guests on as well. Um, we'll get our good friend Chrissy Freud on to talk quarterbacks. I, I want to go into, because let's just assume the Raiders are not going to be in on those top four guys. So if they go with a Penix or a Knicks in the second round, somebody like that, we'll bring, I know we've already talked to her about those guys, but I want to do a little more in-depth uh, based on that. So we'll get her back on the show. Uh, by the way, she was involved. Did you read, Mo, the stuff about the Draft Network? Did you ever read that? Did you finally get a chance? I didn't get a chance to read mm. it after so much going on the weekend, but I saw her comments. Yeah. And I will say I, I'm not part of the Draft Network, so I can't speak on it, but I think it was Arif Hassan did a very in-depth reporting yes. piece on it. So very good. if you're interested in that type of stuff, the industry yes. stuff, go yeah. check it out. Yeah, and even even for those uh, fans out there to read it, it's it just goes to show you, you know, businesses are businesses, and so is online media. 
that cover sports and just a crazy winding road of stories and things going on there. But anyway, so we'll get that. We'll get that. on. We'll get other folks on too to talk about some of these positions uh, and uh, what it leads up to the draft. All right, my man, I will talk to you on Thursday. See you on Thursday. All right, everybody, for our producer, Mike Robbie, a former Moten, I'm Scott Colbrans, and this has been Silver and Black Today. We appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for listening or watching, and we will talk to you on Thursday. Bye-bye now.